Dr. Ngozi Okono-Owala, thank you so much for joining us for this uh, fireside chat uh, uh, on uh, health, vaccines, the COVID-19, uh, of course, also uh, your current uh, role at, as, uh, at the WGO. All those things, I think, will come up during the conversation. But first of all, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Eric. Good to see you again. And uh, say hello to everyone at AIB for me. I have a soft spot, as you know, for so many people. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's, it's, these are, there are many soft spots for you here at the, the, at the AIB. So, so, so thank you. So, so um, obviously, you come to this uh, pandemic in a way more prepared than most people. We review your engagement, of course, at the World Bank, but in, in Gavi. And now, of course, in your new role at the WTO, in one way or another, you, you are very much uh, affected by and are try, trying to contribute to the, um, to the uh, response to the pandemic. So, as you know, AIB has not really done anything in health until the pandemic came. And then um, suddenly we had to do almost everything in one way or another related to health in the pandemic. And, and uh, we have now had this exercise inside the bank to, to think through what we were uh, want to do in health and how we can do it in in um, in so the way we were set up to to do things through projects and so on so so you know against that background and looking at at um, you know you, when you came you come to this uh, pandemic what 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 do you think are the big lessons that we have learned so far well, well, thank you, Eric. I, I, I really think the two or three lessons that jump out at me uh, from the pandemic, and some of that have to do with the health infrastructure. So I'm quite keen uh, to speak to you about this and, and how AIB comes at it. Of course, the biggest lesson, the two big ones that everybody knows is it shows just how interconnected the world is. Um, and, and it also shows how unprepared the world was. And I'm not just talking about poor countries, rich countries were not prepared for the scale of the pandemic. And one symptom of that lack of preparedness is the state of the health systems mm -hmm. of almost every country in the world. Um, I don't think uh, health systems were prepared for the scale of uh, the pandemic. Uh, with respect to the infrastructure, you could see that in many countries there were not enough beds, there was not enough I ICU space, uh, there was not enough uh, personal protective equipment. Now we don't have enough oxygen, not to talk of vaccines and therapeutics. So there was just not enough of things. And uh, quite a bit of that has to do with the health uh, systems. Uh, there's no one health system in the world that has really stood up to this pandemic as well as it should. And, and so um, at the ACT Accelerator, which is uh, this uh, consortium with WHO, Gavi, CEPI, uh, one of the pillars of work is on the health systems. Hmm. How do we strengthen health systems in the world, but particularly in poor countries? So those are some, some just a few uh, uh, key lessons that I think are germane and pertinent to what AIB does. Yeah, no, I think we definitely see those weaknesses also all over Asia in, in almost all countries. There are some countries that have, of course, done much better, but, but uh, and mm -hmm. we see it playing out right now in India and in, in South Asia. And it's, it's, it's uh, clearly there's but a lot. May I just, mm -hmm. yeah, just, so, sorry, Eric. One of the bigger lessons that also came out uh, tied to the weakness of health systems is just, that it just um, further and uh, showed us the inequality in access, um, both in, in rich countries where we've seen that poorer people um, have been hit harder by the pandemic because they've had poor access to healthcare and, and even between rich and poor countries, the same thing. And again, that speaks to what is the health infrastructure that we had in, in place, both hard infrastructure, but also soft infrastructure. Yeah, and I think that's another lesson that we take not only to, to health infrastructure, but more generally that I think the pandemic has laid bare the lack of inclusiveness in, around many 
many infrastructure projects. So, so, so it, when you look at the the world right now, with uh, you know the there are new waves of of, uh, of uh, the virus and new variants of the virus going through the developed world and the and the emerging and the developing countries. And as I said, here in Asia, it's it's very striking, of course. When you look at it, sort of from your perspective, you, are, you also, I forget now, it's special envoy or you are for the um, African Union on, on, on the COVID. How do you look at it at this particular point in time? Well, I am very disturbed in a way uh, that um, countries perhaps that thought they had put pay to the virus or overcome it, um, Obviously, that's not the case. We're seeing second waves and third waves. But more disturbing is the fact that we're seeing all these variants um, that are coming in. Uh, so it's not only an upsurge in cases, but it's also coming with mutations. Um, and so I think we really need to work hard to be uh, able to make sure that the vaccines, which it's been a miracle, everyone says it, but I want to repeat it, to have vaccines developed in such a short space of time. It's nothing really short of a miracle. Mm -hmm. But keeping up the innovation uh, with those vaccines to make sure they're able to tackle the different mutations, I think that is something the world really needs to pay attention to. Secondly, I think on therapeutics, people have don't talk as much, but they're just as important. And um, other intermediate products like oxygen, uh, and it's it's really bad in the case of India now. We see that oxygen supply. This is now the critical constraint. Then then diagnostics, testing. Are we testing enough, particularly in poor countries? Do we have enough kits? Uh, many countries we under testing, so we did, don't really have the proper statistics about the number of cases. So those are the three strands of concerns that I would see with the upsurge. And I think that countries, let's say, let's take con countries on my continent in Africa, we really have to uh, wake up and, and scramble to prepare because we may see another wave. We've been lucky so far with the number of cases, number of deaths, but uh, given what's happening in India, I think all low-income countries, all emerging markets so that need to get ready for a possible wave. And in Asia also, I think um, uh, countries, uh, particularly the lower middle income countries need to pay attention to this. And what do you think the role of the MDBs, the multilateral development banks? You have spent a lot of your career at the World <laughs> Bank. Uh, well, how do you see them in, in, in this? And maybe also relating to what you told, said before about you know, the availability of vaccines, availability of therapeutics, uh, oxygen and so on. And maybe thinking also beyond the individual countries. I mean, MDBs work very country by country. Do we need another model for, for addressing uh, these kind of situations? Well, I think that there are two or three roles we can think of for the MDBs. First, let me say that um, I, I would like to commend the MDBs because they, they were responsive in, in this crisis, we could always ask for more, of course, from them, you know, but, uh, you know, both you've just talked about AIIB not really being in help, but stepping up to the plate uh, to, to help, especially with poorer countries in, in, in Asia. You, you, we, we, we see the World Bank and the IMF step, stepped up very quickly. Uh, with funding, especially the IMF uh, had some very fast dispersing uh, resources that they could put in because, you know, many of the poor countries had little or no fiscal space due to high levels of indebtedness. So when the pandemic came, they had lockdowns, uh, revenues dropped, the, the debt had to be serviced. So it was good to have the IMF step in. The World Bank has come in with substantial amounts uh, of disbursements as well, including 12 billion for vaccines. Uh, the African Development Bank uh, set aside a fund uh, for, 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 I think, 5 billion or so for, for to weather the pandemic. So each institution uh, of the MDBs has really tried to react in the right way. But I think the question we need to look at for the future is what, what is the extent of the preparedness of the MDBs for this mm -hmm. crisis? As you say, you know, it's country by country. And uh, there's a lot of thinking going on now. Do we need another model 
Uh, do we need to think of this issue as a problem of the global commons, where we need to have a special pool of funding uh, to enable preparedness? Because if we had spent a few uh, billion billions, mm -hmm. even in preparedness, we wouldn't have had to spend trillions. Look at what has been spent mm -hmm. on the fiscal stimulus. 28% yeah. of GDP in rich countries, 6.9% in emerging markets, 1.9% of GDP in poor countries, $26 trillion, a huge chunk of the world's GDP. But we could have spent, you know, 100 billion or 200 on prevention. So MDBs have to really focus on this issue and their members have to think, what role can they play in an issue of the global commons? Should we have a pool of funding now? The IMF is issuing 650 billion SDRs. Should some of that be put aside for a problem of the global commons like the pandemic? What should AIIB be thinking about with respect to Asia and other members for preparedness in terms of infrastructure and then for response when the thing hits? And so to coming to that, so... so uh... You know, you have been very involved with vaccines. You have played a very important role in, in, in trying to make vaccines available to poor countries in particular. And uh, of course, unfortunately, we see that these schemes have taken some time to, to really kick in. And then, of course, they are hit now by disturbances on the, on the production side. When you look at these institutions, as remarkable as they are, you know, can they be improved? And, and what, what are the lessons for when it comes to the pr su supply of, of vaccines going forward? Well, I think the biggest lessons for the MDBs is health systems. Yeah. I really think that uh, they need to focus very hard on the weak health systems we have in most of the, the member countries, particularly the poorer ones and work on how can we strengthen this. And I'm talking both from the actual infrastructure to train personnel uh, to the community level for both preparedness and response. I would say that to me is the primary thing they have to, to um, um, look at. Because you know, to get the vaccines into arms, you also need the whole infrastructure, including okay. the cold storage, the logistics of getting it there. And I think this is where the MDBs could really be uh, quite uh, instrumental. I also think the MDBs, particularly like AIIB, IFC, ought to start thinking of uh, how can we support manufacturing, a better distribution of manufacturing capacity uh, for vaccines, for therapeutics and diagnostics all over the world. It is uh, not very, um, uh, it, I don't think it's very helpful that 80% of exports of vaccines in the world are from 10 countries in North America, South Asia and Europe. And uh, you've seen what has happened with the pandemic. When it hits a country, politically, it's very difficult for them to export vaccines like India. All of Africa and many low-income countries were depending on the Serum Institute uh, yeah. uh, production and supply to COVAX. Yeah. But for now, politically, it seems difficult for the Indian government to allow vaccines yeah. to be exported. We have to commend them because they were one of the few countries that actually exported to other countries. But it's become difficult. If we had more manufacturing capacity elsewhere in the world, it wouldn't be so difficult. So I think the MDBs, the I IFC, the AIIB, EIB, really ought to look at how to invest in manufacturing capacity in emerging markets and low-income countries, and how to turn around the existing capacity that is idle. So that's one area I think is uh, worth uh, uh, looking at. Um, do, you think, and, uh, hmm? do you think this, at, at, should we do it country by country, or should we should think of regional solutions? How, how, do you, how do you see vaccine? I think regional, so, no, regional solutions, I think, are wiser because vaccines are so difficult mm -hmm. uh, to really manufacture because of quality issues. It really takes time to set up uh, the factory, even to turn around the existing idle capacity. Now takes, it used to take 18, 12 to 18 months. Now we can do it in six to nine. So it's not overnight. New capacity takes three to four years. So it should be done on a regional basis because I don't think uh, doing it country by country will work. Now, let's take 
um, um, Asia, I think you can have several bases. Of course, you have China. Singapore is developing capacity now. Indonesia has some. You know, so within the region, you could conceive of, th of three or four hubs to serve uh, 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 Asia. Then Africa imports 99% of the vaccines it uses for a continent of 1.3 billion. I think that's anomalous. So we ought to look on a regional basis at what to do. And actually, Africa has set up a vaccine manufacturing task force. Um, so I, I think, Eric, regional answers and approaches are better. Mm. And, and of course, we have then this discussion of what to do with the intellectual property rights around vaccines in the midst of, of pandemics. So what is your, I know this cuts on your current capacity also to some extent. So, so, so how do you see this? I'm right in the middle of it. And of course, yeah. as director general, since I have two sets of my members, yeah. uh, one set who believe that the IP rights should be waived uh, yeah. um, and another set who are not so sure about this. My job is to make sure I, I'm working hard to bring my members together um, mm -hmm. and to negotiate an actual text. Now, here's my response. Mm -hmm. Manufacturing vaccines takes a multifaceted approach. Mm -hmm. You need the manufacturing capacity we talked about. You need a, a supply chains that work. And one of the things WTO members can do is make sure they don't put export restrictions, prohibitions, or cumbersome customs procedures in the way of supply chains. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had 109 uh, export restrictions at the start of the pandemic from all our member countries, 164 member countries. And, and now we're down to 51, which is very good. But for me, it's still too many. So you need to bring that, that down so supply chains can work. The third part, is uh, on manufacturing. How do you transfer? Uh, there's the issue of waiving the patent rights and the IP so people can get access to in the intellectual property, but that's not enough. If you get IP and you don't have transfer of know-how and, and technology to actually manufacture the vaccines, it won't work. So what is being debated now at the, at the, at the WTO is how can we come up with a pragmatic solution that allows developing countries the access they need to these vaccines, whilst at the same time making sure we, do, we incentivize research and development. So that's what's going on. It's not just IP. We need several things to be in place in order to be able to manufacture vaccines. But for some of my members, and you can understand why the developing countries who are at the back of the queue, the IP issue is very important. So you mentioned before uh, your emphasis on, on so health system improvement. What do you think of the possibilities of using now this, probably the most ambitious uh, global coordination exercise, uh, this vaccination, and you, as you emphasize also the deployment, not so much just the procurement, but really the deployment. Mm -hmm. To what extent do you think we can use this and think coming to it from as an MDB? To what extent can we use this campaign to really make more lasting improvements in, in health systems? I absolutely think we, we can and should use this opportunity uh, because as we produce uh, and deploy, distribute and get vaccines into arms, we're seeing the weaknesses in the system, in the total value chain of vaccines. And it starts from you know, the production, which is too concentrated into many countries, like I said, supply of raw materials, skilled personnel. How do we get that? And the MDB certainly have a role to play in this. I think we need public private sector partnerships and MDBs can help governments uh, working also with uh, developing country private sector to partner with uh, the bigger manufacturers uh, to improve manufacturing capacity. Then logistics, we talked about it. Vaccines are special. So we are seeing the, the lack of cold chains and the required logistics for certain of the vaccines in particular. Those based on mnra technology are very difficult logistically to move around. So I think there's a strong role for MDBs to play in looking at the logistics in different countries and preparing them to be able to uh, deliver these vaccines. 
you, you spoke earlier also about um, the need to invest in preparedness. And, and of course, one aspect of that is surveillance and, and thinking around mm -hmm. how can we do surveillance of viruses, uh, and, but of course, other aspects of surveillance that are important too. How do you see that? Uh, can, what is the role of MDBs? What is the role of maybe other actors in, in, in the health space? Uh, well, I think surveillance is extremely important. Um, actually, in the middle of looking at these issues, uh, the G20 set up a, a, a task force to look at financing and preparedness for the next pandemic. And I'm one of the co-chairs. One of the issues that is topical is this issue of surveillance and how do we come at it? But what we are learning from focus groups across mm -hmm. countries and across civil society and so on is the importance of surveillance starting at the community level. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to think of community, you need to think of national, regional, and then global surveillance mm -hmm. mechanisms and work at all levels. And the, the important thing is how do you incentivize particularly at the country level surveillance, because if one country gets it wrong, mm. then of course it impacts the, uh, the mm. neighboring countries and eventually the globe as we saw. So uh, those are some of the issues, it's critical. I think mm. the MDBs can also play a role in this in trying to help think of methodologies for incentivizing surveillance. Yeah, we, we, so we, we had our uh, uh, health kind of exercise or, or health, um, uh, thinking through process here at the ARB. This is one thing that we really wanted to look into. Do you know this area of One Health, where you, you know the link between animal health, uh, human health, and, and climate? And of course, part of that is, is zoonotic diseases and monitoring. Yes. You have the AMR, uh, antimicrobial mm. resistance. These things that connect um, different um, parts of, of the. Uh, our, our ecosystem and, and human and, and, and animal. So all this is very much on the agenda here. I don't know if you, if you want I, to- I, I, Eric, let me say that I think it's very proper and that, uh, uh, you know, not looking at zoonotic uh, diseases and, and the eventual uh, connection with climate change is also very, very important. I think we should approach it from a global commons point of view yeah. and really invest the resources needed to make sure we get surveillance right. And of course, we have to work with the medical community uh, in setting up the right kinds of uh, processes. No, and, and, and I think we are also very much understanding that we need to work with uh, you know, many players and, and also with the private sector and, and looking at our own investment, for example, in sewage, uh, mm. wastewater treatment and so on, where, where actually these, uh, surveillance can become a very important uh, part of, of the in, in investment. Well, you have taken a lot of your time uh, uh, and we are very much grateful for that. I don't know if you have any last words of, of advice to us as, as we embark on this uh, road on becoming a more serious player in, in health. Well, I just want to say that I was really very pleased. I know that it's not the typical area, I haven't been on the advisory board uh, that AIB has been playing in, but these are the problems of our times. And I just want to say I'm quite proud of the way AIB has stepped up. And I think you really need to strengthen that aspect of AIB's work um, because we've all learned the lesson now that we have to be better prepared for the future. So I hope you strengthen the health infrastructure aspects of the work, the prevention and preparedness aspects. And secondly, that we learn the lesson, uh, uh, link it to climate change, mm -hmm. and also uh, start thinking of better ways to work with our members uh, on the climate change front. So that's, that's my message. Keep it yeah. going, strengthen yeah. it, this is really relevant. Well, thank you very much. and, and um... All the best of luck in your new role, and, and uh, we, you're playing a very important role for for your part of the world, but also uh, globally. And and this panel that you are co-chairing uh, together with Thorman uh, Shanmugaratnam is is a very important uh, process, I think, to collect information on different parts of the global community and 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 really translating this into lasting changes. So 
thank you very much for your service for the global community and, and we are very grateful that you took time to talk to us. So, so thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you.